Greetings, mobile accomplishers. Welcome to the Verge Mobile Show. This is episode number 69 for the week of number 18th, 2013. I am Dieter Bone. I am Vlad Savo. I'm Dan Seifert. And I am Chris Sigler. <laughs> you had a long pause. Uh, so I'm in a different room uh, because I'm in New York, where I live now forever and ever, at least for a while. You had an opportunity, Dieter, to say that you were anywhere. You could have said anything in the world, and the listeners would have had no option but to believe you, and you decided to just go with New York. You could and have if said... He had, if he had said Chicago, nobody would have believed him either. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not a very good troll. You're not, you people aren't even trying anymore. You're where, just like... Where? You're just like, all I need to do is mention Chicago, and it's an automatic troll. No, put some effort into it, Dan. <laughs> Uh, at least I'm not in Poughkeepsie or whatever. Poughkeepsie? Poughkeepsie? No How's it pronounced? It. Poughkeepsie. No, it's not. That's a yeah, lie. Yeah, it's, po- it's, it's Poughkeepsie. 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 Right. Yes. Not, right. Which, uh, you know... I have no retort because, frankly, there's nothing nothing really great to say. Poughkeepsie about. is like a game that Winnie the Pooh plays when he isn't sharing his toys. Listen, when I was in elementary school... There was many sections in first and second grade on spelling your address. So, right. Well, in, in any case, that that stop, stop looking for Kipsy, man. The rural lands are good for people. All of this urban <laughs> environment stuff is what leads to depression and whatnot. Uh, Actually, and also, speaking of urban uh, environments leading to depression, we need to have a long, deep, heartfelt discussion about how bad. All of the uh, cell phone carriers, all the wireless carriers are in the city. I thought this was supposed to be like a uh, metropolis. In fact, metropolis is based on the city. And there's supposed to be civilization here and connectivity and well, things working. But no, here's, here's the AT&T thing, is dropping everywhere and there's phantom data. And Verizon recently, like, it's come out that they're struggling. And, you know, like, if you don't, I'm just gonna you're get lucky enough to get fired, right here. you <clears> are screwed <throat> yeah. in terms of getting, you know, internet connection. Um, I, I just, like, what's going on? I don't know what to do. Because I get no AT&T signal at all in my apartment. However, uh, I need to have AT&T signal, so I need to get a microcell. But I don't want to pay an AT&T bill, so I don't know if I could just get an AT&T microcell without an AT&T account. I pretty much can't, so I pretty much have to pay for that. But it's really not going to work because it's dropping the other places I need to go. I don't want to get a Verizon account. I'm all about switching to T-Mobile, but I want it to actually work outside of the city, and apparently it doesn't. So basically, I am giving up. I'm 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 quitting smartphones forever. That's the only option that's left to me. Awesome. So now you can run around with a Lumia 1020. <laughs> oh, get some wow. really nice photos of those urban environments with all the graffiti. So I, I would just I would just like to point out, Dieter, that you you mentioned that Metropolis is based on New York City, as if that means that it's supposed to be a wonderful place. Yeah. A, a, a perfect utopia, when in fact it's a, it's, it's a dystopia. So I don't think that's a very good uh, analogy to make. No, I meant Metropolis um, of, of Superman, not Metropolis the movie. Oh. Totally well, different. Metropolis the movie is also based on New York. Mm, okay. Mm, okay. I, 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 don't know what, I don't know what's Mostly. up with Chris. Is it that uh, New York got more Michelin stars in the recent ratings than Chicago? Is that what's going on here? Chris is tired of us trolling him about Chicago. And I well, can't blame him. Just, it, it's also just not... I mean, of course New York has more Michelin stars. The city is three and a half times as large. So? I, I, that's not even a but, troll. But the key metric is per capita. The key, the, the key metric is per capita, and I believe New York beats Chicago per capita as well. Am I right, Chris? In 2014, they're actually, I think, about even. Um, <laughs> in, 20, in, in 2013, New York was ahead, but uh, in, in 2014, they're about even. Chris, it's just funny because you know, man. You shouldn't know that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> if, the if reason I know that the per capita metric exists is because of you, Chris. <laughs> if, if you don't know all the cities, or excuse me, all the restaurants that are Michelin star rated in your city, you are not doing your job as a human being. How many Michelin stars does Sbarro's have? Uh, they're not even <laughs> Bib Gourmand. They're, 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 not, they're not in the list. <laughs> Anyway, please let's let's go back to talking about something remotely phone related. 
I was I. What do you guys recommend I do? So so Dieter, uh, part of the reason that all of it kind of sucks in New York City is because it's a metropolis, the big buildings and whatever. Uh, but no, I agree with you. Uh, it's supposed to be this mecca for awesome cell service and whatnot, and it's really not at all. It's funny because people ask all the time, what cell phone service should I get in Midtown Manhattan? Uh, and frankly, none of them really work that great. Our office is located in Midtown Manhattan, and you can walk a block and lose all your signal and walk another block and get all your signal back and then walk a third block, and it's all gone again. Uh, I don't mind losing crazy. signal. I just want my signal to be accurate. The problem that I have with AT&T in Midtown is like, I, it'll look like it's fine. It'll show me yeah. four bars of LTE, and everything's awesome, but really, no. There's no data. There's, yeah, there's, there's a... There. There's a, uh, a Chipotle restaurant a couple blocks from our office, and, uh, well, I, I say restaurant uh, with a very loose definition, but, uh, you know, you can stand there, and my AT&T phone will say that I have, like, five bars of LTE service, and I can't, like, move any data in and out of that phone. Like, it, it's just complete dead zone, but the, the phone claims that it's got full service. Well, so this is exactly what hatnets are designed to solve, right? I mean, like, the, the dream is that in the future, in the not-too-distant future... AT&T will have thousands of small cells deployed across uh, Manhattan, and this will cease to be a problem. Because, I mean, yeah. you can, like, you can imagine how, like, trying to accurately and completely cover, uh, a, a, you know, urban canyons like you have in Manhattan with traditional cells is extremely difficult for pretty obvious reasons. Not, not to give AT&T a pass, but you can understand why it's hard. Yeah, um, no, and I, I, I wish that, you know, like, it was... They they should be giving out these microcells like candy. Like I should I should just whisper microcell and they should have a truck at my door <laughs> with one. They should come I in bubble packs like at Walmart when you check out yeah. like, my prepaid phone. You just they grab should, a microcell to go with it. They should replace phone books with microcells instead and like just have them piled up at your door, getting wet from the rain instead of the yellow pages. I I've been I've been thinking about microcells for a long time and I I think that they present a huge PR challenge. For carriers, which is why none of them talk about the fact that they have um, uh, microcells or not microcell uh, nanocells or whatever the pico cells. Um, the, the reason they don't talk about them is because the fact that they exist is an admission that the network isn't perfect. So the only way they can offer them is very quietly and without advertising them and without talking about them. So that's why you just never hear about them. Well, yeah, but I mean, everybody who uses the damn network knows that it's imperfect and that word of mouth uh, particularly when it comes from such erudite mouths as Dieter Bones has an effect on people and it, it might you know influence you to go and look in with another carrier. What I would say from my limited experience of New York is exactly what the guys have been saying is that it's extremely spotty. So for example um, there was one instance last year when I was there when we had Verizon uh, SIM cards and LTE and Verizon when it works and when you have good connectivity it was just amazing. It, it blew my so socks off. It was just it was like faster than what I get at home. Um, but at the same time if you, can't, if you can't get that consistently, if you can't rely on it, then it's not that much of a comfort. What I would say is that London is rather the same way and it has a lot less of the excuse that New York does with the tall buildings because London doesn't have that many skyscrapers. Uh, but it's just a spotty with coverage, and that includes both 3G and 4G. I mean, I'm uh, with the free network here, and I have uh, the equivalent of um, the femto cells that you guys are discussing with AT&T. But I do have a question, and Dieter is the man that's uh, ideally suited to answer it, which is, how does New York compare to San Francisco in terms of coverage? I mean, we can kind of guess, but... So uh, AT&T has completely, uh, not completely, they have, they have come a very, very, very long way in San Francisco to the point where uh, it's probably the best network out there uh, overall. It's better than Verizon in my experience uh, in San Francisco. And T-Mobile's, you know, not that great. Um, so it's actually um, not quite 100% flipped because I don't think Verizon's superb in New York. Um, but I wasn't expecting AT&T to fall down as hard as it did in the places where I need. Now, that said, when AT&T does have signal in New York, it's fine and fast, except for yeah. those phantom things. Um, so it's, it's mostly a coverage and getting around the buildings issue, I think, um, except in, like, really, really densely populated areas like, like Midtown. Um, I, I don't know. I'm going to give T-Mobile a try. I'm going to give 
uh, I might I'm gonna give the microcell a try. Um, the other thing that sucks is like the perfect solution is I should just port my number to Google Voice and then like whatever week I feel like using something and I get angry at somebody else, I could just bounce around. But no. Google Voice says that there's no number porting available for my phone number. I don't trust Google card. Voice anymore. I don't, like, there's no telling when they're going to spring clean that thing. Like, I, they, they promise it's going to get built into Hangouts, which maybe that's another reason not to trust it, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I can't wait till that happens, and then you have, like, one phone app, and you've got your, like, regular phone calls and your Google Voice phone calls, and, like, they're not, like, well, meshed well together. Now. Yeah, but, like... Like they did with Hangouts with SMS and Hangout chats, and they tried to put them in one phone app or one app, oh, and they yeah, don't yeah. talk to each other at all. And oh, yeah, so I mean they got to fix a multiple account problem. Um, all right, you know, Dieter, the other option that you have on AT and T and T Mobile is Selfie, which was originally launched with T Mobile, but is now available on AT and T as well. And it's it's like a booster, but a little more clever. It's also a lot more expensive than a regular booster. But um, you have a remote unit that beams the signal wirelessly to your base unit that rebroadcasts it. So right, but in it, order for that to work, your remote unit has to have a lick of signal, right? It's got to have right. a little bit to, to work with. Right. Well, that might, that might work. And that one is nice because it'll just work, and I won't have to actually, like set it up uh, a GPS located account with a carrier or whatever it's just and it also doesn't rely on your internet the problem I have is that when my Comcast dies which is about once a week I lose my phone too so will a Selfie work across across T-Mobile and AT&T or do I have to buy one for each I think they're different units yeah that's what I thought just before we wrap up this topic I do want to mention that Sprint exists (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so uh, speaking, uh, speaking of Sprint, uh, and we'll talk uh, more about this later on, uh, Republic Wireless. But let's um, just talk about it now. Use, Come on, uh, right now. Bring sure, it. Sure, we, we it. can talk about it now. Um, so I, I, I tested uh, the Moto X on Republic Wireless, which uh, you know their whole deal. Uh, Paul Miller did a big piece on Republic a couple years ago when they first launched in beta, and their their whole concept is that they offload as much voice and text traffic to Wi-Fi as possible, which is you know more. Uh, valid of a concept now than it ever has been because hotspots are everywhere. You have Wi-Fi in your home, you have Wi-Fi in your office. So 90% of the time, you're just connected to Wi-Fi and you don't even need a cell signal for anything. Um, and then for that other 10% of the time, they offload you to the to the cell network. Um, and their, their, their plan pricing is from $5, which is actually just Wi-Fi only. You don't have any cell access, up to 40 for uh, Sprint, Voice, and LTE unlimited across the board. And they have a I want to say it's a $25 plan that's unlimited uh, voice texting and 3G data, and then a $10 plan that's unlimited voice and text, but no cell data, which is kind of unusual and interesting. So you can see how that's a really good option. You just want, you know, and, and also the $5 option, the Wi-Fi only is great um, if you just want to have a phone to take overseas, because then whenever you're in Wi-Fi access anywhere in the world, um, it just acts as your regular phone uh, right. with your regular phone number. So... Um, and the Moto X is priced really aggressively too. It's $299 uh, off contract, locked to Republic, uh, but it has its own ROM. Uh, it ships straight from Motorola. They don't like cook it their, themselves and then like rebundle the phone and then ship it out to you. Motorola is actually making it in their factory and shipping it straight to you with the Re- Republic ROM. Uh, and it worked really well, but uh, what I wanted to say vis a vis Sprint is that they use uh, the, the only cell network they use is Sprint behind the scenes. Um, and Sprint's vocoder is like a national embarrassment. Like, <laughs> can you define vocoder for people who are not? Uh, it, it's it, it's the, the, the uh, yeah yeah it's, it's the algorithm that they use to uh, turn uh, your voice into bits. Um, My and, man, pin drop and, and vice versa. Well, no. So the the funny thing you it's fun, it's funny you mentioned the pin pin drop. One thing, one really curious thing about Sprint's vocoder, it's extremely low fidelity. It's like. It's I don't know how many kilobits per second it is, but it's definitely it's audibly way lower than what anyone else uses. Um, and one of the the weird things about it is that when no one is talking, it shuts completely off to the point where uh, you you think that the call dropped. So I, I found that I kept uh, putting the phone down to my face and saying, "Is the is the call still on or not?" Oh yes, it is. And then I put it back to my ear because like you know, with a normal vocoder, you can kind of hear a little bit of hiss in between talking. Uh, but with this, it just goes completely dead, um, which is kind of unnerving. So, and then when people are talking, it just kind of sounds like uh, Charlie Brown's teacher. 
So it, it's like it, it's completely worthless. Not completely worthless, but moderately worthless as a calling device. The, 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 the irony is is that like Sprint is was the first carrier in the U.S. to offer any HD voice option, and yeah, yeah. yeah. there's so few that's. I and mean, they, T-Mobile does they now. They still but, have got a little bit of a lead in HD voice. I mean, uh, well, in, it's very it's device specific, right? Yeah, that's the uh, thing. And if you don't have a device that works on it, I don't even know what the latest actually. Phones that you know work the funny thing, now, so. When we went to this uh, this last sprint event, when they were talking about their crazy uh, spark with the the super fast, um, sorry, I just bumped the microphone. The super fast internet speeds with the the three different bands that they use, which is actually in New York. Right. So they were talking about HD voice, and apparently HD voice gets encoded differently depending on the network hardware. So like. I forget wh- who's where, but, like, Ericsson's in one corner, and, like, Alcatel owns another, like, the southwest corner, and, like, somebody else does the northeast corner of the, of the U.S., and they're f- the first, they'll get HD voice rolling, but it'll only work within the network, so it'll only work between, like, Alcatel uh, c- networked calls, and then it won't be till next year that they actually have HD voice working across those different networking systems. It's, it's completely, completely screwed insane. up. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not Sprint's fault. That's just how it works. But it's insane to me that well, like, high quality voice is that complicated. I would say it I is mean, Sprint's fault. I would say it is Sprint's that there's a standard. Like uh, when they laid out the network, they should have said the only way we're doing this is if this is interoperable. Well, that's what they're doing now and, with and, their and new and little yeah. boxes. Device specific. You can't just like turn on any Sprint yeah. phone and call any Sprint phone a HD voice. I know. I, I don't know what is different with the implementation with T-Mobile, but as far as I understand, it is not device specific. And it's also uh, so, it's, it's also only within Sprint. You can't call anyone else and. I don't know about you guys. I don't know anyone that. Oh no, that's not true. I know one person who, with a Sprint phone. So like, there's there actually isn't anyone you can call to experience HD voice. It's like it's kind well, of a the, non-existent feature. The, the chances that the person that you know that has Sprint also has a phone that is compatible with it and is also in an area where the, it actually works are like, you know, uh, the Lions will win the Super Bowl before that happens. So, Speaking of <laughs> things that are completely impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody I, explain to me so why. Sorry, <laughs> Somebody explain to me why the first, like, other than, like, the Nexus 7, whatever, the first, like, big mass market phone to get Android 4.4 was on Verizon, and it was a Motorola phone. The Moto X on Verizon, KitKat is rolling out for it right now. And it beat yeah. everybody else. It beat yeah. the Nexus 4. It beat the unlocked Moto X. It beat, like, everybody. It beat, beat the Google, Google Play the edition Google Play of the HTC One and the Samsung Galaxy S4. The only explanation I can come up with is that Motorola and Verizon have been pretty cozy for many years. But that yeah. still doesn't really explain it because Verizon is notoriously uh, tight-assed with, uh, with firmware updates. So like, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, when I talked to the Verizon I, Galaxy Nexus, right? Yeah. When I talked to them about the the Moto G, I was like, "Why don't you have KitKat?" And they're like, "Well, it just got released." I was like, "Yeah, but you guys are in the PDK. The PDK is the platform developer kit where people like HTC and Motorola and also Samsung also you're owned get to by look Google. Early. Yeah, <laughs> but they that. don't get tre- they don't get special <laughs> treatment. They're like, "Look, yeah, you know, we're, we're we get to look at the stuff early, but it's not until the day that they actually release it." that, like, you can really start building on it, and it's not until, you know, you also have to get, like, all the chip makers on board, too, so, like, there's always going to be a lag time, but we're working as fast as we can. I was like, okay, well, you know, that makes sense. It's still stupid, but it's fine. I understand. So I was expecting it to be a little while, but they blasted that thing out, and then it's just up on Verizon, of all places? Like, yeah, I don't know what to do about that. I really, like, I need someone to explain to me how to think about the universe now because I, I don't I suspect I suspect Chris um, has nailed it insofar as uh, Verizon might have put pressure on Moto- Motorola to make that effort um, I feel like I I'm not, well hang on there I, I, I don't think Verizon would because no but uh, if you're Verizon why would you want Motorola to uh, put out the awesome software update on its branded phone when you could have it out on your uh, filthy Lucre droids that you make more money off of. Lest we forget that the Verizon Galaxy Nexus, which is actually listed as a Galaxy Nex or a Nexus phone, uh, with the you know all of the factory images supplied by Google and everything, is still on Android four point two point two. It's never going to get Android four point four, but it doesn't have Android four point three, which the other Galaxy Nexus devices have. 
Uh, so th there's just like so many things here that do not add up to why this happened the way it did. Yeah. But, okay, Meanwhile, then, it's but not like we're all speculating like... at this point anyway. It's of not like Verizon not. is suddenly awesome because they're still playing games with the Verizon version of the Nexus Seven. Uh, there, it's not out yet. They said they were waiting for KitKat, which is bonkers. Um, so it's not like Verizon is all of a sudden like pure as a driven snow and like super consumer friendly. It's just like this weird confluence of like, I don't know, I don't know what to do. No, but but, but that that's my point. And uh, like I said to Dan, this is speculation. We we don't know, but. If you're looking for motivation for why Motorola will prioritize one over the other, I would think, well, if you go and buy Google Play Edition, uh, who is looking after your interests? It's just your phone. If you go and buy the Unlock phone, again, it's your phone. Um, nobody's going to Motorola and lobbying on your behalf. Whereas Verizon, in a rare moment of insight, uh, might have decided, OK, at and had this lead on us with the Motor Maker. We can kind of steal some thunder back with the Moto X by having the KitKat update first. That uh, might be, you know, one reason why they might have pushed for it. All right. Now that you put it in terms of politics and trying to screw the other guy, now it makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. But so, at the end of the day, I, hey, I had to translate it into Moto America. Customer, you're right. <laughs> at the end of the day, if you're a Verizon Moto X customer. And if you're not a Verizon Moto X customer, day. you can be one for 50 bucks on contract. So Moto Maker's available for everybody. I think that expired. Oh, that expired? It was 50 bucks. It's crazy yeah, how they cheap did it, they did. Uh, that it got fast. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's now 100 bucks, which is still a great deal for the Moto X. Yeah. Uh, but this past weekend, they ran a deal, uh, which it could still be going on. I could be crazy, but I thought maybe it expired by now. Actually wrote the article. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's wrote, gonna so. it's gonna be fifty um, bucks again soon. I'm sure that there's gonna be all sorts of holiday yeah. deals for it. Yeah, come Black Friday, it'll probably be free. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it's a great value, and the fact that not only is it a great phone that we've proven time and again through our reviews and our experience with the device, uh, it's a great value, and it's got the latest software from Google. So yeah, and I nobody mean, cares. It's reportedly only sold five hundred thousand units. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yet nobody's buying it. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. Like I, I, I don't understand why the Moto X is a retail flop. It has all the, the like hallmarks of what a phone needs to succeed. And like you can't tell me that people are going into the into stores and saying, "I know Samsung. I want a Samsung. I'm going to buy nothing but a Samsung." I mean, maybe they are, but it, it's like I, th I think a lot of people are, and I think you know. A lot of people, a lot of the people that work in the stores, the actual sales reps, are very familiar and very comfortable with selling the yeah. Samsung devices. Uh, and you know, when it comes down to it, when the people come in, are like, "What phone should I buy?" Uh, the I could totally picture a sales rep being like, "Buy a Samsung," or you know, "Buy whatever their favorite phone is," uh, or whatever phone puts the most in the market. Thing. I guess it's something that you need a few generations, a few iterations of a device from a company. Um, for people to develop a comfort comfort zone with it, yeah. uh, because the way that I feel right now, the LG G2 is the best phone that you can go out and buy. It's the phone that I'm using, uh, and I make no apologies about using Cyanogen mod on it until LG straighten out their skin. You do have to apologize but it's not the for best using phone the back buttons, uh, guys. I'm sorry. The there's there's some breaking news here right now. Um, this is a courtesy of uh, Mike Isaac. If you go to Twitter's blog post, uh, they've they're, they've got um, new search filters that are announcing for their app. Uh, but more importantly, if you look at the Vine uh, for it at about the two second mark, you can see some of the um, accounts that they've got that are, you know set up around the Twitter office. <laughs> and one of them is Twafis Shitter, which I'm pretty sure is the Twitter <laughs> account for the bathroom at Twitter's headquarters. Wow. And it, it's not verified, though. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm, I'm sorry. I uh, You were talking about the G2's back button, and I had to interrupt you <laughs> because I can't ever hear about that again. <laughs> okay, so, so I'll, I'll just face it forwards and not face it back. But seriously, I just No, no, I just Vlad, want to mention... I, I challenge your point the... because you just said that it's the best Android phone that you can buy, and then no, you're just like, phone. I have to install... I have to install software to fix it because it's broken out of the box. Like it's that's the best that phone. Is not the best phone that you can buy. This this is the best phone that you can buy. Uh, and I'm not alone. Paul O'Brien feels the same way. And he's Paul O'Brien of Motoco. And he's the smartest guy in England. So there you go. Wow. But the reason I raised it. Doesn't Stephen Hawking live in England? 
I think he lives in the U.S. Is he in the U.S.? Okay. I think it does. He was in England for a while, anyway. Sorry. Um, but the reason I, ra I raise the G2 is because, to me, the G2 and the Moto X are pretty unique in just how crazy small the device is compared to the screen size. Um, like, I haven't seen phones like them, any other phones quite like them. And, you know, if you were to tell me that I would love using a 5.2-inch phone, I would just say that's crazy. But right now, having used the G2 extensively, I literally cannot go back to using an iPhone 5. Like, 4-inch size is too small for me. And then there's the whole Gmo app fiasco, which is still not improving at all. Um, but, you know, my thinking is people might go into a store, they might see a G2, they might see a Moto X, and they might say, that's pretty nice hardware, but I don't trust these guys. They haven't done a good phone for months or years or however long. Or, or they go sure. in and they're like, my mom or my, my, my kid doesn't own a G2, or my kid doesn't own an LG, they don't well, own a Motorola, well, like the my example best friend. That D Dita had, uh, it doesn't have the Tegra, right? <laughs> well, that was me? You, you know when you're in a store and there was some old oh, couple? Oh, yes, and that's like, right. Man, does it have the Tegra the inside it? I brain on Vlad remembering that anecdote. <laughs> that was like six months ago. Pretty soon we're going to be talking about legit pandas. <laughs> yeah. It's been a while. Wow. Good time. I think that actually predates me. So. Oh, that was before you. Well, you were where you you were here for our all of our uh, triumvirate and uh, four stuff. Damn. We educated yeah. somebody. So somebody on Twitter said that before us he didn't know what trifecta meant. And, no, no, uh, uh, no, troika. Tro troika. Oh, troika. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, troika. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully we educated uh, some other people about quadriga because that's what we are now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's I've talk about big phones then. It's, the uh, the big G2. phones? Oh, you don't want to talk about the Moto, uh, Moto G? Oh, yeah, God, the Moto G. God, a lot of stuff happened last week. So, yeah, yeah. the Moto G. It's uh, probably the best phone I've ever touched that has a retail price of under $250. If they don't use nothing but a G thing as the song for the commercial <laughs> for this phone, they have missed out on one of the most amazing opportunities for There's for so many places they could go with it. Uh, they could go, they could uh, pair up with 50 Cent and, and mar market it as a G unit, uh, or, you know, nothing but a G thing. I mean, yeah, so much, that so, was so good. Places it could go. That's good, Dan. Yeah, I know. That, that's right. uh, anyways, although so, associating so, it as like the hip hop phone, I don't know. You're, you're kind of limiting your audience. Yeah, but those songs are like, uh, you know, they, they span all time and space and genre. Yeah, like I'm pretty sure that uh, 50 Cent's song was number one on, like, all of the Billboard charts that it could be on for quite a few weeks. So yeah. but, th but then there's the other thing. The Moto G is intended to be sold in areas that might not have a Billboard chart, right? They, because that's what they Motorola is targeting here. Hip-hop is uh, cross-cultural. I bet they know it. It's American. It's it's, it's just it, it crosses boundaries, man. It's it just everyone's everyone's American now. Um, like so, anyway, song. Uh, so Einstein. the Moto G is a unlocked uh, phone that is actually it's it's kind of like a mid range device that Motorola is selling at an entry level price. In the U.S., you'll be able to buy it for 179 bucks for an eight gig version or 200 bucks for a 16 gig version, but not until uh, Q1. But not until Q1, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, Motorola is really not pushing it hard here in the U.S. because this phone is designed for emerging markets and areas that smartphones don't uh, have the the kind of uh, penetration that they have here in the West uh, and in developed markets. So uh, people can actually get a really good experience uh, on the Moto G. Uh, for not a whole lot of money, and it's it's actually like really surprising. The screen is four and a half inches, and it's a 720p display. Uh, in many respects, it looks nicer than the 720p display on the Moto X because it's an LCD as opposed to uh, AMOLED. So it's got uh, you know great viewing angles, great color. It's not as uh, oversaturated. Um, it's got a quad core Qualcomm processor, so it's got like a real processor in it. Uh, it's it's responsive. It the build quality is. Just about the same as the Moto X. Um, but and, mention two yeah, things. So like the, 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 the two things that are down, it's missing LTE, um, right. and it also has a five megapixel. it also has a crappy five megapixel camera. Yeah, um, the camera's not that great, but like, you know, 
it, it takes pictures. <laughs> I mean, if you compare it, if you compare it to other two hundred dollar phones, like it's a much better camera than what you normally get on a two hundred dollar phone. Like you, you got to figure this thing is going to be priced against the like uh, Lumia five ten, the uh, Firefox phones, uh, and then like whatever Samsung lowest Galaxy end model Ace, Samsung whatever. Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and so, those are like terrible devices. Yeah, they're they're really bad. So the the well the Lumia 520 is pretty good. I guess that's a rare exception, but yeah. it's not it's not HD display. It's not a quad core processor. It's uh, so you know, and a lot of other things that it's not. I was totally with you, um, and I still am that this is a pretty remarkable device uh, for the price. Uh, I s- nice, um, but. Uh, a bunch of people, when I was tweeting about it, were uh, uh, talking back to me and uh, a couple DMs too. That, like, it's actually not that remarkable a device if you look, especially in China, which of course the Moto G isn't going to China. Um, but a bunch of it's a bunch of like phones in this range are being sold around this price. It's just we're not seeing it here because it's not, none of it's coming to the U.S. market, and a well, lot of it is is located I, in Asia. And the, and the main thing is that like the margins on phones have distorted our sense of what they cost. Maybe. Well, I yes. mean, as, as my, my retort to the, the Chinese phone argument is that, you know, I, I can't say for sure how uh, the level of quality that those phones that sell around that price bracket in China are, but I imagine it's not as nice as the Moto G. I've actually, like, having used and touched the Moto G, it's actually really well built put together. It's a really nice screen. Uh, you know, it's not doesn't feel like it's going to fall apart in your hands. And then none of those Chinese phones have access to the Google Play Store, uh, which the Moto G does. Right. And I honestly think that that is a value quotient right there, uh, which yeah. is uh, makes it more valuable to me and I think many other people over like a Lumia 510 for that matter. Um, so, yeah, there's I'm sure there's like plenty of phones that we never see here in the U.S. I don't know how many are actually hitting these uh, marks that the Moto G hits. That's all. I was just going to say, there was that uh, top-end Asher phone, which was quite cute and fun in terms of like the design and using it. Uh, so, I mean, the competition isn't all absolute garbage. Like, I would totally agree on those Galaxy A series. Nothing has a nothing has a 720p display. Like, no, of the course. Asher phones maxed out at mate, what WVGA, yeah. uh, and then most of these things have QHD displays at best, and they're not good QHD displays. Yeah, I, all all I'm pointing out is that if you're not going to be all that bothered about the camera or LTE connectivity and things like that, um, may there, there are well-designed phones in, in that price bracket. They're not all complete and utter garbage. But something else that kind of stands out to me is how, and maybe this is to Dieter's point about the chips being cheaper than we might think, a quad-core Snapdragon processor in there. I mean, first of all, Qualcomm is just owning the entire market right now, which is... Yeah. Uh, but for, and, and it seems to be because they're pricing those chips aggressively, because I am surprised. I am surprised to see that kind of power in something like the Moto G. And you guys are speechless with surprise. So. <laughs> well, as you know, it's, it's, it's a, great to see agreement. It's Snapdragon uh, 400, which is uh, Qualcomm's lower end uh, lineup, but it's the first one that we've seen, at least here in the US, or that I've seen that has a quad core version of that processor. Uh, right. We saw the 400 in the One Mini and in the HTC First uh, with a dual core chip, and it was okay. It was passable, um, but the quad core is actually noticeably faster, and maybe it has to do with the fact that the the software isn't as heavily themed and things like that. Um, uh, but just, just the just HTC One Mini doesn't have the Snapdragon 400. I'm pretty sure it was in the 600. No, it's it's a, it's a 400. The One Mini is definitely a 400, dual core 400. I reviewed it, man. It can't have been a 400. I think it was. I'm telling you, I it could is. be wrong. Then then HTC just slipped out by me in that case. Oh. <laughs> Um, all right, let's talk about the Lumia 1520, the giant phone, which also, like, this is a, a watershed uh, device because I believe it marks the first time that um, we have written the word phablet in an yeah. article without immediately you know, apologizing for it. We broke uh, down like, and did it. This is the, this, that's the term now. They're called phablets. Okay. Just, We've accepted that big phones are here. We've accepted that Note 3 is a very good one. We've accepted that the Xperia Z, Z, whatever it is, is gigantic. It's just what they are now. They're big, and we're just calling them phablets, and we're not sorry anymore. Everyone points out that it's a Snapdragon 400 into one mini. I was wrong. 
Dan wins. Yeah. Can someone explain <laughs> to me? Doesn't happen very often. Can someone explain to me why the Chronic is not on Spotify? I just want to play. <laughs> I just want to play nothing but a G thing. How long have you been looking? <laughs> <laughs> for like 10 minutes. <laughs> they're, they're, they're like 20 Wait, covers. Hang on. Of... Dude, what? just go to YouTube. I would there, say... There be any song that I haven't been able to find on YouTube. Yeah. Every other mobile show, Chris, you like disappear and are focusing on something and I assume that like you're working because like, yeah. you know, I know stuff is going on and the business of the Verge never stops and sometimes I am doing that too but most of the time it's you. Um, but really, you're not working. You're just like cruising I'm Spotify. For Dr. Dre tracks. <laughs> No, sh no shame in the game. <laughs> Don't hate. Okay. Yeah, anyway. I, I, I can segue us back. I can segue us back because I interrupted by mentioning the Snapdragon 400. And uh, the Living 1520, if I'm not mistaken, has a Snapdragon 800 inside it. Right, Dan? Uh, that's correct, yes. It's the first Windows phone with a Snapdragon 800. Uh, it's got 2 gigabytes of RAM. It's really, really fast. It's definitely the fastest Windows phone that I've ever used. Uh, Windows phone typically is not slow to begin with. It's a, it's a very responsive user interface. Uh, but the uh, Lumia 1520 is noticeably faster when you are opening apps and switching apps and things like that. Uh, and at this point, it really just feels like the Windows Phone animations of constantly opening that fan and closing that fan to do things is what slows slows you down uh, more than the processor. Uh, so that's a, that's a kind of a good thing to see. Um, the screen is tremendous. Here, I have it right here. It God, is... that is big. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm really holding back from uh, <laughs> it. It's really bright. It's got great viewing angles, if I uh, tilt it to the side here. Uh, it's actually really, really bright outdoors as well, so it's really awesome outdoors. It's got all of uh, Nokia's tricks for polarization, the clear black. Uh, it works with gloves, all that fun stuff. Uh, so it's a really it's a great display. Um, and then the build of the device is pretty much, if you took a, if you're familiar with the Lumia 720, and then you put it on one of those medieval stretcher things and stretched it out. Nice. It's that that design. Um, but yeah, it is a six-inch display, and it is very much a very very big phone. Uh, it is pretty much impossible to use one-handed. Uh, and you know, it's uh, I'll open up the um, on-screen keyboard here. You can just see how massive that on-screen keyboard is. It's actually, the, the on-screen keyboard is taller on the 1520 than it is on a Nexus 7, which I find uh, highly hysterical. Wow. And, uh, you know, and that kind of just gets to my point of Microsoft did the bare minimum uh, to optimize Windows Phone 8 for a device this big or a screen this large. Uh, I mean, you they optimized see... most of their core apps, right? Well, they say they did. Uh, you know, they they they. Uh, you can see on the screen here. I've got three columns going, so I can have more tiles in one space. Uh, it makes for a bit of a jumble and a, and a lot of stuff going on. So uh, it's a bit intense. You can see they're all flipping and all that fun stuff. Uh, so I don't have to scroll as much, which is nice. Uh, none of the tiles can be stretched out to the full width, so you are still limited with two columns. Uh, but that is the biggest noticeable difference between this and every other Windows phone. Uh, Microsoft says that it, it optimized the core apps, but it did, like, the bare minimum. In the email app, I can see about half, uh, half of a more email in the list. Uh, I can see one line preview more uh, on the contacts. I can see maybe, like, two contacts. And on the app list, I can see four more apps before I have to scroll. Uh, but that's about it. And that's, what it, about it doesn't the browser? Make any any sense. difference there? No, browser is exactly the same. Uh, and so when you compare it to like, here I've got the. Uh, what do you compare it to? That amazing massive tripod in the background. Yeah. <laughs> it's like here's a huge so, thing, and then here's another huge. When thing. when you look at how much bigger it is than say a nine twenty five, which is not really a small phone to begin with, uh, you'd expect to get far more out of that giant screen real estate. And I think wow. you know. They, they didn't really do much of it at all. So it's just, like, bigger for the sake of being bigger. The fonts are giant. The icons are giant. Everything is giant. Uh, I thought but... the 925 was an iPhone when you first brought it up next to the... <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's uh, compare it to the iPhone if you really want yeah. to. Can, uh, can you hold the iPhone, iPhone horizontally so, so we can see if it's wider than the iPhone is tall? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm trying to trying to keep the screen on, but I keep, you know, obviously, it's a giant screen, and I'm touching it as I move, but, uh, yeah, so you can get an idea of, of how big that is. So it actually doesn't fit in my front pocket, 
uh, I can't sit down with it in my front pocket, and in my back pocket of my pants, it like sticks up by about half an inch. See, this uh, is so why only... you need a Galaxy Round or a G Flex, <laughs> right, Chris? Yeah. The only the only pocket that I can keep it in is in like the inside pocket of a uh, blazer. Uh, otherwise, it's just it's just far too large. Uh, it also doesn't fit in my American sized cup holders in my car. Oh, an- another point though. Fit, another point about the inside pocket of a of a blazer, which people might not appreciate. I had an HC1 Max in this, that exact position, and what what you what would happen is that my jacket will start to tilt in the direction in which the phone is. I'm not even yeah. joking. Like it I would mean, just be leaning. It's it's heavy uh, as well. You know, Nokia phones aren't really light to begin with, so you know this this size of, of massiveness is is heavy. And so you know, the thing that I have the the issue that I have with it is that there's obviously a market for these big phones. I think Samsung's proven that they you know they're, they're three iterations into the Note line. It's actually a really good device if you want a a phone that's really giant. You know, the Note offers a unique experience. Uh, the problem is that Nokia and Microsoft aren't offering a unique experience with this, and uh, the software gives you the same experience you might see on a 1020 or a 925 without, like, really any difference as opposed to the, the extra column on your home screen. I mean, so, uh, how, how close is this thing to just, like, you kind of just wishing it you had Windows RT on it? Y- you know... Who wishes they had Windows RT on anything? <laughs> <laughs> Windows RT, Windows RT has its own issues. Uh, <laughs> but, you know... It's. I think they even I, I, is Windows 8. I think yeah. That yeah. I was about to say. Like I think yeah. a, a more fair comparison is to say like at what point do you wish it was just a Dell Venue Pro, or Venue yeah. 8 or whatever they're calling it. Or right. like here's here's a comparison to a a, a 2013 Nexus 7, uh, and you can see that it is nearly as big as the Nexus 7. The difference obviously being that the Nexus 7 has real tablet software on it. Um, so. You know, I think that the the 1520 gives us a lot of preview as to like what the next Windows devices will be like with the awesome processor and awesome screen. Um, but man, it's so you big. know, it, never once in using any Windows phone have I ever said, "Gee, I wish I had more CPU." Like, yeah, never. It's just not an issue for that platform. Right, right, and I mean. Unless you compare them side by side, you know, your your 925 or whatever, if you happen to own a, a Windows phone, is not going to suddenly feel slow unless you compare it side by side with the 1520. It is it is a tick faster in animations. It's just a little bit more responsive. Its scrolling is is a little bit snappier. But, you know, like, like you said and like I said, Windows phone has never been wanting for, for more power. So, right. uh, I mean, the, the good thing is that it's now a 1080p display, which the older phones were not 1080p displays, and this has no issue pushing around the 1080p display. So uh, that's good to see. Uh, and it's the typical build quality is great from Nokia. Uh, the camera is kind of average. I think that's one of the bigger disappointments. Uh, this is a uh, it's a pure view camera. Uh, it uses the same technology as the 1020, but it's a 20 megapixel version, so it's not as extreme as the 41 megapixel one. But it is... Uh, not as good in low light as the iPhone 5S. It's definitely not as good in low light as the 1020, and it's just slow. It takes a long time to open, a long time to take a photo, and a long time to save that photo. So it's it's no. kind of a that, that's but, terrible. I, that was my little silver lining that I was hoping would be the truth with the new CPU, and, the new processor. That exactly, it would and that's things up. That's what Nokia said would happen. <laughs> they said, you know, this new processor will let us do a lot of photo things uh, faster and things like that. Uh, but it it's slow compared to you know comparable iPhones and Android devices. So so really, it's it's an issue with the software rather than the hardware. Yeah, I think they can they could probably improve it, software wise. That's the feeling I get. Did you try um, any of the? Did you try to take any raw photos? Is that compatibility available so yet? It is. Uh, it shoots. Um, so w- when you normally take a photo by default, it will shoot a five megapixel image and a uh, 19 megapixel image and save both of those. And that's really where it slows everything down is when it's saving those files. Uh, the 19 megapixel image lets you recrop and do all those fun things with uh, Nokia software. Uh, the other option, if you go into settings, you can have it save a 5 megapixel JPEG and a 19 megapixel uh, DNG file, which is a raw format that is kind of universal. Uh, when you do that, you lose all of the ability to recrop and play with all the fun stuff on the phone. So it's pretty much, you know, if you just want to uh, put, throw it in Photoshop and tweak it from there. Um, 
I didn't actually spend a whole lot of time doing that because uh, the last thing I want to do is is take a photo off my phone and, and tweak it in Photoshop. But if you want to do it, it's there. I think you'll have more fun with the 1020 doing that though, because it's it's a better camera. So yeah, totally. Dieter is ready to own the 1020. <laughs> I, I think that's going to be the overwhelming theme of our podcast today. Um. No, listen. I mean, I'm I'm still just like dealing with the fact that like I've accepted that phones are, th are this size now. Yeah, here's a uh, so I have the One Max uh, with me as well, so you can see the this 1020 is about the same size as the One Max, which uh, I think we said was too big, and then the <laughs> uh, the Z Ultra is here, and this is actually uh, bigger. Wow. Uh, yeah. So that's 6.4 inches. Um, so these are phones. You can put them up to your face and make a call. Those are things with phone-like features and capabilities. Well, and, and you know, um, when you, and you, know, you guys are never going to convince me to say phablet. I'm, I'm sooner <laughs> going to quit than say phablet. I mean, like I've, I just kind of throw my hands up in the air because uh, you know, it's either use a lot of words to describe this or just say one word that I don't like very much. So. What's the one word you don't like very much? Oh, phablet. I don't, just I don't say it, man. Phablet. It's a fabulous, fabulous day with your phablets. <sighs> so you know what? what? Actually, instead of, instead of this, I think I just want the Porsche Pinan 982. <laughs> Are we seriously talking about that thing? Yes, oh, yes. Vlad has one. I, I am going to do a live unboxing. I'm currently Wait, fingering... did I get the numbers right on the on this phone? The Pinan... Pin, uh, what's it called? <laughs> the Pinan 982, that's right. Pinan 982, I got it right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... To, to get the unboxing started, I would just like to say that the outside of the oh, box wait, has a very fine to, texture to, to it. Hang on. We need to we need to let people on Twitter know that we're we're doing a live on. on are you allowed to to put this thing out there? Are you under any sort of embargo, Vlad? <laughs> a little late now. Uh, well, if I had any shame, I would just like not do it. But yeah, uh, uh, yes, I am I'm allowed to put it out there. Okay, I'm just asking. <laughs> I, just just on the topic of the world, I don't want to live in. Um, I am unhappy that today we heard that Samsung has actually shipped 800,000 Galaxy Gears and Chris enlightened me about the Motorworks only selling half a million. Uh, I know one is sales, the other is shipments, but still, the fact that even retailers are willing to commit to 800,000 of those atrocious how, watches. When do you think they made those how orders? Many best buy, how many Best Buy warehouses does it take to hold 800,000 uh, uh, Galaxy Gears until Samsung takes them back? It's a good question, dude. So Kwame, um, uh, our uh, weekend editor here at The Verge, he did actually point out something worth noting, which is we were all joking and making fun of the original Galaxy Note. Now I'm not no, saying that. No. no, hang on. No, stop. Just let me finish. Just a bit of it. No. Bit of it. Bit. We were. Everybody was. Yes, we were. Included. Yes. But I'm not saying this is the same thing. No. But I am saying. There's an interesting parallel there that maybe, just maybe, we could have egg on our face in when like the shipments turn into sales. Just, just the, the, the key difference between the gear and the note is that the note isn't actually a a good, good device. product, right? It's yeah, a yeah. good product, yeah. and the gear is like fundamentally not. It might be at someday if Samsung actually like updates it and makes it better, but the one that you buy today is not a good product. No, and, like, it's not. So yeah, th that's the key difference. Yeah, I, I do not expect any egg on my face with regards to the Galaxy Gear. It's well, an you don't need eggs, so I don't, how would it even happen? <laughs> what? We, we're not even going to go there. The egg, okay. Wait, the, do you the, eat the, eggs? The egg is like the perfect food. And that, oh, that's so you not do me eggs. saying it. There's a Duke professor who is like uh, the PR guy for eggs because they have like the... <laughs> They have the, like, the perfect protein breakdown, and they give you all your necessary fats and all of those good things. Anyway, I do eat eggs. Uh, I make amazing omelets. Yeah. You should come to my house. Okay, so the phone. All right. Wait, wait, Vlad, do you eat cheese? Or, I do you're, cheese. you're making an omelet without cheese. That's a travesty. Okay. Carry on. Uh, I do make omelets without cheese. Um, but yes, the Porsche That's just scrambled eggs. <laughs> Sorry. Dude, there are French people who you just offended. I mean, there's a whole country you just offended. 
Um, there's a lot of. Fr- by the way, system. France just issued a travel advisory against its its uh, citizens traveling to Chicago, so I don't care about offending the French. <laughs> why, why? Why don't? Why doesn't? Why doesn't France want people going to Chicago? Because uh, of the crime. Because, no, I think wow. it's because they're going to be swindled into eating something that they think is going to be pizza, and it's not pizza. Wait, 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 Chris! Don't don't <laughs> react to the troll. Just is that is that for real? Yeah, yeah. Chicago Tribune published it today. Wow. Okay. Uh, I mean, they thought about. Uh, I, I don't know. I was going to try and make a surrender joke, but I couldn't come up with anything. So let it go. Okay. So Blackberry. The reason I am showing this box is because, like, the very purpose of this thing's existence is in the accessories and in your imagination. So you have to imagine the fine texture of this box. Okay. So then we open it up. And then there's more blackness, booting up the anticipation, and then there's these two things. This and is a low really, point for the virtual show right now. It's really <laughs> fitting that there's two things here in the foreground because one of them is the phone itself, uh, which has steel and it looks real, kind of nice to be honest with you. Well, it's real leather, which might piss a lot of people off, you know, animal rights and whatever. Uh, also, Blackberry tell me it's real. Italian leather made of Italian cows. I don't know if that matters to you. Um, but anyway, no, it has so, a chin on the bottom, right? No, it doesn't. It's flat. No, but it's got like a little... Dirt, 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 instead of being straight across, it like has a little chin. Chinny chin. Like a, a Z10 doesn't doesn't go down as far on the bezel underneath the screen. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's like rounded off on Oh, the... okay. Okay, I was thinking chin like with the HTC. No, no, no. no, not like a... Not like, yeah, not like Bruce Campbell chin, like a chin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not one that protrudes forward, but yeah, just yeah. one that goes down. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's got a, a little bit more. That's a stainless steel part of it. But seriously, even, even the Blackberry guys who were showing this thing to me, they were struggling to come up with differences from the Z10. It, it, it so was, it's the same internals, same processor, same screen, all that jazz? Yeah, it just has 64 gigs of storage. Why didn't they go with the? Uh, I mean, the cool thing about the Nintendo 981 was this uh, was their crazy keyboard and going metallic, and it didn't fit with uh, you know the other Blackberries. They should have totally uh, just done the Q10 instead of the Z10. I mean, is it really going to affect sales the same one way or the other? Honestly, when you look at this thing, the P9998982, it's it's just a Z10 with the top and the bottom. Of the P nine 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 eight one, yeah. Like they, I I could have done this in a minute's worth of work, and I don't do design. Now, Vlad, I mean, uh, with the with the original Panana, uh, <laughs> the uh, BlackBerry customized the software, so it had like special Porsche icons and things like that. Is that any different with this one, or is it the same software? Oh, dude, you, you get a you get a unique well. BBM pin. Uh, you, well, wait, 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 wait. That's that. That's important. Let, let's get through oh, the God. trivia first. Um, We're not really. We we've spent like ten minutes on this. <laughs> but wait, there's a there's a Porsche I'm, theme I'm really ringtone on this thing. It's a Porsche theme ringtone, but it isn't actually an engine noise. Okay. Uh, and boot up and shutdown animations have that PD Porsche design logo happening. And from what I understand, the Porsche design guys are just like this other group which is licensed to use the name, basically. They, they have nothing to do with the actual Porsche designs. But anyway, uh, not that that matters to the people who are interested in this. Here's what matters. This is the other hugely important part. It's a credit card size thing which makes you a literal card-carrying member of an exclusive club. And you have a unique pin. Now, what I'm going to say is that exclusive club is going to matter to some people and not going to matter to... It's going to matter to people that have more money than brains. That's really what it is. Uh, I mean, it, you, it really depends on wh- how you define that club. That's it. Whether you want that phone or not. Uh, yeah, price tag also is worth mentioning. It is $2,400. Totally worth it. Yeah. Uh, well, if you want to justify it in hardware terms, they do have a charger adapter for every single region in the world. And one of the tiniest freaking batteries ever. I mean, I look at this battery and I just, I'm just embarrassed on their behalf. Like, seriously. So somebody did a calculation and they said you could get something like um, a dozen 16 gigabyte Moto Gs for the price of one of these. 
I mean, the, the reason this phone exists is because it's profitable, right? Like, they, they sell it in, like, two yes. regions where everyone is a billionaire, and they'll sell them. And, I mean, the phone costs marginally more than a regular Z10 to make, and it's they're selling it for steel. 10 That's the other much. thing. The only premium material here is the leather. And, right. And, right, oh, yeah, oh, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, they, it probably they costs them 10% more conversion. to make or something. They oh, have fantastic. A conversion with only 500 being made. <laughs> and I can still see and, them and, like, and having 300 of those are review units. The, like, the, funny yeah, thing, <laughs> the funny thing to me is that like the people who buy the, if I actually saw someone who owned this, I'd be like, dude, this just means you couldn't afford a Virtu. Like, oh, yeah. it, it's, the <laughs> poor man's it's the poor man's virtue is all of it. <laughs> it's, wow. Uh, no, it really it's is. like the, the Acura phones, is that... I don't know. It's, it's a decent way of... I mean, you yeah. just offended everybody who's listening to us who owns an Acura, but sure. I would I would buy it. I would be I would be grateful if I could buy an Acura. I would be super happy. <laughs> not in not New York, you wouldn't be. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> um... All right, we should we should probably wrap up pretty soon. I do uh, want to take a brief moment to say that uh, new FCC chairman Tom Wheeler is not, at least in his first couple of weeks, week, however long it's been, the uh, super pro carrier tragedy that we were all expecting. That'll come later, but so far, Chris, he seems to be like doing okay. He is not the worst person on the planet so far, which is encouraging. Yeah. Um, I, I think that he, uh, honestly, I mean, this might be a little overly optimistic, but it almost seems like he was motivated by the amount of momentum that um, that Clyburn generated, and he's trying to keep that up. But right. um, he, he actually just circulated moments ago a memo on um, how he wants to take action on... Um, uh, moving the country toward an all-IP infrastructure, which is code for ripping out the, the landlines. Um, right. Which, uh, there are many, many forces at play in that conversation, uh, and it's it's still open for debate whether that's actually a net good thing for consumers or a net bad thing. Um, so the, the, the jury's still out, but that, that literally just happened. So he's moving very quickly, and he's using, in every memo I've seen of his, he's using very strong language. He's saying... You know, we got to do this right now. We got to act. He actually put a, a like a time window on that memo he sent to Steve Large and President of CTA. He's like, I want this resolved by December uh, with the the phone unlocking stuff. So the the dude is is looking to move. Um, we'll just see if he can keep it up. Uh, and what's this the, what's this drama today, Chris? I know that you you don't have any strong feelings about this uh, cell phone unlocking thing that's oh, happening. Huh. Today. Yes. Oh my goodness. Um, so. There's this story, I believe it originally appeared in the New York Times, um, about how uh, carriers are pushing back on a, um, a proposed requirement to, uh, to load phones with software that would allow users to remotely lock them uh, if they're stolen. Carriers are allegedly pushing back because they're worried that's going to cut into um, insurance profits, because the, the insurance plans, which are very popular, are also very profitable, which is why every time you go to, say, a Best Buy uh, and you buy a $3 um, CDR, they're like, uh, do you want to insure that for two years for $25? <laughs> um, and, so, and so, yes, I agree in principle that, um, that you know, remote lock and wipe is great, uh, I think that it that this is kind of bizarre and misguided and a little backwards for a few reasons. One, I can't think of any other physical object owned by American citizens where the government requires that they be modified in some way to disincentivize people to steal them. Like we we don't we don't require we don't mandate alarms or low jacks on cars, which are obviously very heavily stolen things. Um, and secondly, <laughs> and secondly, carriers just took action late last year on um, a national IMEI blacklist. So there, there is a way to prevent these phones from being used after they're uh, stolen. But ultimately, the question becomes: like, I, I, I think it's a bridge too well, far. Well, hang on, a national that. IMEI blacklist doesn't solve the problem because a lot of these phones are getting shipped overseas. So that you actually need to disable the the unit itself, right? You, right, but that gets to my last point, which is that regardless of how you approach this, you're still not solving the the problem of a 
of a shady guy coming up to you and taking your phone. Because they're not thinking about whether, oh, well, I wonder if maybe this phone is going to be re remote lockable. They're just like, gank, and then they, they walk away. Yeah, but I mean, the idea is that if, like, if, they, if it becomes known throughout the world that phones will be disabled if they're stolen, there will be less incentive to steal them. Well, that has certainly worked well with Lojax. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm just. I. I, I don't think. I, I don't know. I, I just think that this is. This is uh, an example of people having their hearts and minds in the right place, but it is not the right battle to be picking. Right. And believe me, there are many, many battles to be picked with carriers. I don't think this is the right one. That's all I, I have to say. Disagrees. <laughs> uh, on that note, I think it's time to wrap up the Verge Mobile Show. If if you disagree, then I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can. I am at Backlon. Dan is DC Seifert with an EI. Chris is Z Power. Don't call him Z Power. Vlad is Vlad Savov. Don't call him Vladwick. We are all at Verge, and next week, we'll see you guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.